Hello, everyone. Welcome back to a new edition of Collider Dailies, another edition with a wonderful filmmaker to introduce you all to, Leah McKendrick, writer, director, star of Scrambled, which is now available to buy and rent on digital platforms. Congratulations on your movie, feature directorial debut. That is such a big deal. It was insane. I feel like I'm finally breathing after, you know, you're you're kind of the show pony. You're like out there like, I did a thing, I did a thing, please watch it. And now I feel like it's off into the world. It doesn't need me anymore. I'm, I can return to 90 Day Fiance. So I'm excited. <laughs> <for that. laughs> Let's <jump> on. <laughs> we were talking about it before we started recording. It does seem like it's gotten out into the world in the best possible way. And really over the last, I guess, like month it is now, I, I keep hearing about it and it keeps oh, yeah. popping up in the right places. And it's just making me think that it is getting the audience it deserves right now. That makes me feel really good. I don't, I feel like I'm too in it to even know. Like you start to think, I can't speak for anybody else, but my experience was like, everyone is lying to me. The only people that love it are friends of mine or friends of friends and everyone is lying to me. So it's really nice when I get like a DM from like a complete stranger saying like, thank you or like loving the film. And then I start to believe maybe they're not lying to me. Maybe the world is actually seeing it. Maybe people are actually seeing it. So I, I really do believe that that's happening. But right now on dailies, we're going to make sure more people see it. So just in case anybody out there does not know what Scrambled is, I have a brief synopsis here. So of course, as I said, Leah stars in the movie. She plays Nellie, a 30 something who spends her weekends hopping from weddings to baby showers while nursing a broken heart due to a recent breakup. When a doctor discovers her fertility may be in jeopardy, Nellie opts to freeze her eggs. The arduous and pricey process sends her on a journey of self-examination that ultimately brings her face to face with the one she's meant to be with forever, herself. I love that synopsis. I think I pulled some of that from your South by Southwest page and it was just, it was good. Pack the punch it needed. I'm actually gonna gonna look back a little for my first question because I believe the first time we ever spoke was for a short film you directed and wrote and starred in called yeah. Pamela and Ivy. So yeah. I'll, I will start there by asking what was the key for you to bridging the gap from being a short filmmaker to a feature filmmaker? I think sometimes when you make a short, you don't even know if you're capable of it. You know, you're almost for yours. I can't speak for anybody, but myself, I'm like, can I do I know how to direct? Can I figure this out? Acting and writing and directing and wearing all the hats and the experience of making Pamela and Ivy because it was it was bringing to life my favorite supervillain, Poison Ivy. You you sort of that's your North Star. You're like, I just want to do her justice. And it's, so it's a lot less about you. And then you get through the process and you're like, I think this is pretty dope. And then you get the confidence to go do I have the stamina to do what I did there? I think we'd shot that in like six or seven days. Could I do that for another, you know, 15 days? And you're like, I think I could maybe. So I, I feel like it's so important for filmmakers to experiment and to try their, to, to try their hand at new, new, um, you know, wear all the hats on a short film. Why not? Making a short is, is so much more um, safe in some ways because nobody's really watching until they are. And like you, for example, you writing that beautiful article on Collider was like a really huge moment for me. And I think very validating because I'd made something as a director for the first time and thought, wait, like, she liked it. Like, maybe it's cool. Maybe it's kind of cool. I don't know. It is kind of cool. And it was only it was only the beginning. And here we are with a first feature. Um, I'll build on some of what you just said there. Can you tell me something that, I don't know, was kind of like an innate skill for you in terms of making a feature film, something that just came naturally. But then I also want to know something that put you on a little bit of a learning curve when making the pivot from short to feature. Something that came naturally is working with actors. I have, I'm an actor through and through. I speak in emotion. I love actors. I think they're brave, courageous, emotional beings, and I want to protect them. And I am, I want to protect my inner actor. So I love to, I could talk all day to actors. Um, they're just down to play always. They're trying to, they're down to try stuff. They're down to experiment. They jump in full force all times. Um, the hard thing for me was not being able to watch myself and not being able to review footage because 
I think I, I would not move on if I didn't feel that my actor had it. I'm watching my actor. I'm listening to my actor. I'm with them. But you can't, you don't really know if what you're doing is translating. Also, you're really immersed in what they're doing. You're really listening, which is such a gift as an actor. But you're kind of like, and for me, I would move on and then be racked with panic. Like, I, did am I doing the thing? And I don't want to, I don't want anybody around me to know that I'm like feeling deeply insecure because I don't want them to lose faith in me as the director. But then at night, every day I would come home and I would watch my footage because it would be uploaded as it was happening. And I would watch it all. And then I would start to go, no, it's happening. It's happening. It's happening. It's translating. I have to trust myself a little bit more. And Jonathan, my producer, told me, he was like, just go again. If you don't think that you have it, don't even yell cut. Just reset and go again. Because the thing that takes a long time is moving the camera and, and, and a new setup. But go getting grabbing another take if you're in doubt is not what eats up your day. So that, I was like, oh, I can do that. Oh, I can just do it again because I'm the director. I could do that. So it was like, you know, trusting myself a bit, even, you know, as an actor for sure. Oh, I have many follow-up questions. I want to go back to the the first half of that answer because I think this is an important thing to, to to emphasize and put out into the world. What is something you do as an actor's director in order to protect your actors? Well, one a big thing is uh, there's a lot of sensitive stuff in this film in particular. There's a lot of sex scenes. There's a lot of, you know, some pretty intense conversations about fertility and pregnancy loss and... I think the main thing is just really trying to to see through their eyes what do you need like what is going to make you feel and I think we had a um an intimacy coordinator and she was so great because then you get to really have the awkward conversations of we're going to strap this on and your body's going to be strapped in here and how are you feeling today and I think sometimes actors are not given the space to even bring themselves to the conversation it's like and this is how I was taught in acting school. It's like, it's not about you. Show up, hit your mark, do the job and get off set because there's a lot going on. But I think if an actor doesn't feel comfortable with how their body is strapped in to look naked, for example, they're not going to do their best work. Or if they're thinking like, I don't really understand this line or I, and I, I would just be like, what do you want to say? Just say what you want to say. Throw the script out. Let's just play. It's you and me. We're in it together. I would show them the. I would show them my. Um, I would call it my clam bake, which is my monitor. I would show them my clam bake, and I'd be like, "Let's watch it together," so that they can almost direct themselves and adjust. And they're like, "Oh, you're right. That's not. I got to move this way. Okay, let's try this again." And I would just bring them into the process so that they felt like they were also a filmmaker because they are. They're molding their own performance just the same way as I'm molding mine. So it's, I think it's just bringing them a little closer so that they know that I'm not trying to make anybody look bad. I want them to look their best. I want their best performance to shine for the world. Um, and we're all on the same team. What an ideal quality to have in a leader on set. I swear this will lead into a question, but everything that you were just describing, I think probably significantly contributed to one of my favorite parts of the movie. Like you were the lead, but it almost has like a little bit of an anthology feel to it where you have these like little vignettes with different people in her life. And every single one like feels full and memorable and has a really catchy energy and chemistry to it. And I feel like it's because you give these actors ownership over their roles and they're believing in every single word that's coming out of their mouth. Oh, thank you. I mean... I hope so. I, I All my actors are like such stars in my film. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in the time, I think that's another thing is like coming from a career as an actor myself, I have felt on many sets, and this is no disrespect because it's so hard to make a movie and I get it, but I have felt on many sets, your job is to say the words as written on the page. Your job is to deliver exactly what you did in the audition. Your job is not to be buddy-buddy. Your job is to show essentially a speaking prop right? Because we have bigger fish to fry. We have a lot going on. And so my hope was that they did feel free to, to craft this scene like their own mini movie because so many of my actors are only in one scene, right? They come in, they shine for, and then they're out. So my hope was that it was like, you're like you said, like an anthology and everybody gets, it's like, like my, one of my favorite shows is Black Mirror. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. 
I always <laughs> like her so much. But every single episode has a completely different look and vibe and theme. It's it's so epic. So that was mm. my hope. Great success with that here. I have a couple follow-up questions. When you are casting a movie like this, what do you look for in actors that, you know, will signal to you that yes, they will crush the role you want them for, but also that I guess they'll be a good sparring partner for you in these moments? Yeah. It's a tough it's a tough thing that I look for because I was telling students at Chapman University where I went to school what I look for and I know this is a hard thing to sort of um to create for yourself and to seek, but ease. I'm always looking for ease because I want someone that has the confidence in what they are there to do to play. I don't need anything to be word perfect. I don't need, you know, if you don't want to hit your mark and you're like, I think I belong here, let's go up, we're moving it. You know, I'm just, I want an actor that is malleable and has their own point of view um, because I'm a big believer that actors are not props, that actors are storytellers. I was just an actor and then I suddenly started writing and directing and producing and now I do a lot of things, but it all began with my love for storytelling. So I think that th that actors have all of those skills within themselves as well. So I want them to trust themselves and show up. And if they mess up, they go in a new direction, they try this over and so many, like my actors in my film are, all of them are, are they had such ease and such confidence. And so like Santino who plays my brother, so much of what he says is, is not in the script. <laughs> he's just gonna, he gonna, I mean, there was takes where I would just, I, it was his coverage and I'm like this, not even looking at him because I'm trying so hard not to ruin the take by laughing because he knows what he's doing. I don't need to direct Santino. Santino is gonna find the best stuff when I'm, when it's off the page, when he's in the scene. So it's finding actors that have confidence to, to experiment and, and just, fall deeply into the world with ease. Oh, you have such a good lineup here. And it's one of those situations where I like, I know a lot of them are very experienced, but I watch them in, you know, smaller roles here. And I'm like, well, can't wait to watch you lead a movie in the future because you're something else. So true. As, as we start to wind down our scrambled portion of today's Collider Dailies, I feel like you kind of have the heads up because you've seen my Instagram. You've known that I, I ask this a lot. And it does feel like a really important question to ask for someone's feature directorial debut that they also starred in and wrote. I want you to pinpoint something you accomplish, a specific thing in Scramble that you know you're going to be able to look back on and say, I am especially proud of what I did there. I'm especially proud of the dance sequences. <laughs> I'm especially proud of dancing in my room to candy and dancing at the weddings. And I think my one of my biggest notes was they were like, you got to cut down this changes montage. You got to cut it down. You got to cut it down. And I was like, no, it's perfect. And they were like, you just want to do a musical. And I think deeply, I, that's the truth. I just really want to do a musical. Um, and I love when people say that they love the music and the dancing in, in bedrooms because that's just so deeply me. It's just who I am. Who I am at my core is a 16-year-old girl listening to Britney Spears and dancing in my bedroom. 100% has that effect. It, ma it makes the film feel like so deeply human and I'm sure relatable to many out there. Yay. I lied. I'm squeezing in another question before we move on to our, our little news topic of the day. I feel like you might you might be aware that I might bring this up too because I love horror. I mean, I'm wearing my 90s horror shirt today with the I faculty. Love, love you. The faculty was my favorite film for so many years. Josh Hartnett for life. Did you know that he's doing the new M. Night movie? Mm -hmm. I am so excited for everything. Like he is crushing it right now. Crushing. Seeing him in Black Mirror, like he still looks incredible. I'm just so happy. I'm just the hugest Josh and Kevin Williamson and all of it. We could talk about this forever. But oh, I, I really could go on and on. In addition to watching The Faculty over and over, I also watched a movie called, I know what you did last summer, <laughs> over and over and over again. Too, and me too. You and me both. <laughs> I do know you're involved in writing the sequel that's coming up. So I had a couple of questions about that. Yeah. First, I, I wanted to know, how did you get involved with it to begin with? Is it is it safe to assume that you and uh, and Jennifer were, were friends and knew each other before and kind of developed that concept together? 
No, we actually did not know each other. I was a fan of hers. Um, I really love Someone Great. I think it's like, it's, it's an incredible modern romance. Um, and I just love the IP. I love the original film. I grew up on it as well. And I was really missing horror because my first film, MFA, this indie, small indie, um, is a rape revenge film. And I grew up on horror. Like, that is my heart. And I feel like sometimes people don't believe me or something. And I'm like, I don't know if it's because I'm a chick. I don't know if it's because I write a lot of rom-coms. I don't know if it's about the way that I look. I don't know. But people, it's like I always have to keep knocking on that door. Like, I love horror films. I want to do horror films. Everybody's like, that's so awesome. Here's a rom-com to write. That's amazing. Here, you know, go, go write this cute rom-com for teenagers. And I'm like, no, I want to I want to cut heads off. I want to like have blood all over the walls. <laughs> so I had kind of said... I'm really burnt out on the studio, big IP. They had killed my Grease prequel at Paramount. And I was like, I can't build from the ground up over many years for an IP that I cannot, I don't have ownership of at all. Um, and then they called me, my team called me. They're like, so we know you said you didn't want to do any of that anymore, but they are thinking of bringing back. I know you did last summer. And I was like, Ugh. I was like, maybe one more and I sp and I the reason I was able to go in is because it's it was a Sony film. I have a relationship with Sony and it, the producers I also had a relationship with. And I and I found out it was Jen that was going to be directing it. And more than anything, I thought I think I because my love is so deep for I know what you did last summer, I have to protect it. <laughs> I must protect it. I can't let this be like cheesy and like a cash grab. Not that anybody was going to make it that, but you know, you feel when you would get it, Perry, when it's like they're rebooting something that you love so deeply from your childhood. You're like, I know how we can do this and not make it cheesy. And it can stay true to the mythology and we can bring back the OGs and it can be a culmination. And like, you have all these ideas. So I thought I'm going to, I met with Jen Jen is so cool. Jen is so smart. Jen is just like down to try some edgy, cool ass shit. And I was like, I'm going to give this my best shot. And I pitched. All they told me was they were like, we need to know the accident, the event that kicks it off, mm -hmm. know who the killer is. So that was so they were like, because they knew that if I had to do a whole fleshed out like process of pitching, I was probably just not going to do it because my heart had been so broken by the reboot game. Um, but when they told me that, I was like, I know, I know what I'm going to, and I don't want to, no spoilies, no, no spoilies, but I will say that I think if you're an OG fan like me and you, you're gonna, I hope, I think you're going to be happy. I think you're going to get it. No spoilers. I'll ask one like semi-dangerous question here, but before I even say that, I, I will tell you that when, when the news first broke that there was going to be another, and especially that the OGs were returning, I was very excited to read that. But the fact that you and Jen are involved is, is what really gives me confidence that, you know, it's people behind it that will treat it, no pun intended, like, like the baby that, that I look at it as. Like it is, it's a pretty big deal in my horror filmmaking loving life in terms of just it being one of those early films that is very responsible for shaping the horror movie lover I am today. And all I want is for it to be in good hands. And when I saw that report, I'm like, it is, I can sleep easy at night. Jen knows what she's doing. Like what we worked hand in hand um, molding it and from my pitch and we went in and we just got got our hands dirty and dug in and she is not afraid of some certain things that I would be afraid of as a director. Like she's like thinking spectacle, like she's ready because she's an experienced director. Like she's ready to knock out some really complicated um, ideas and, and, and big kills. And she is unafraid. I will tell you that is going to be a wild fun ride. I'm really excited. I love hearing that. All right, here, here's my my tougher question. It's kind of like the million dollar question when you're bringing back a popular franchise. How how will it give fans more of what they already love from the original, but while also kind of spicing it up and justifying another chapter of this story? Oh my gosh, that is so the million dollar question. <laughs> I mean. It's hot people doing questionable things, right? 
at its core, I think it it's it's it it really reckons with some big ideas about hero and villain, right and wrong, how your skeletons come back to haunt you. And in the age of the internet and the age where fame is is such a it's such a revered concept. It's like people, uh, the creation of TikTok and social media, it's like, you know, who is Julie James in a world where there are no secrets anymore, right? Like I might have already feel like I'm saying too much, but I, but I think at, at its core, we, if you watch the original, I don't know if you've watched it recently. I obviously watched Maybe. it 8 million times while, <laughs> while working on it. But it's fun, you know, like it's just a popcorn wild ride. It's campy at times. Jennifer Love Hewitt is so hot. Freddie Prince Jr. is so hot. Sarah Michelle, Ryan, they're just so, they're so gorgeous. It's like beautiful people behaving badly. You just can't get enough of it. There's a lot of that in this film. So get ready. <laughs> That was all the right answer. My my interest has somehow peaked even more than it already was before. All right, before before we move into our, our news topic of Collider Dailies, I'm just going to remind everyone, check out Scrambled. It is available to buy and rent now, and I cannot recommend it enough. So get on that. All right. So I pitched you a little uh, our news story for the day, and I figured because like we're all steeped in Oscar predictions right now, but I don't know. I kind of wanted to take a moment to highlight who who we might vote for if yeah. we were in the Academy and had that ability. So I've got I've got uh, I've got uh, six categories listed out here, and I thought we would start with best supporting actor. So I'll give you the honors first. If you could choose who won best supporting actor at the Oscars, who would you pick? I'm going Mark Ruffalo. Are yeah. you a poor thing fan? I I am, and I had a feeling you would be. You know, you know, but I just think he specifically in that film is like every toxic guy ever. Like he's crying and he's emotional and he needs you, and he's slapping you and he's insecure and he's stalking you. It's like that line between love and hate that he's just constant. He can't figure it out and he's a mess and. It was one of my favorite performances of his ever. And, and also, I'm just a big fan. So. Yeah, I don't blame you. I wouldn't mind seeing him win. Um, he was talking a little bit about how like that role is so outside of his wheelhouse that he was getting the impression that it would be wrong for him to take it. So I love the idea of someone being rewarded for, for a risk, a role that they thought was wrong for them that yes. they then realized they could excel in. So I love yeah. that. Totally. I might pick. Sterling K. Brown for American Ooh, Fiction. I just okay. think that's a perfect example of an actor who takes, you know, like a really well-written script, but he took what was on the page for that character and just made it so uniquely his. Like, I can't see anybody playing Cliff quite like he did in that movie. Totally. I mean, he's also just, you can't keep your eyes off of him when he's on screen. He's one of the, I would love to work with him someday because he says so much, even just his face, you're you're like, what's he gonna say? You kind of like, he's like hard to read. You're like, ooh, it could go anywhere. He's so fascinating as an actor. I really love him. We we like to manifest things on Collider. You will work with Sterling K. Brown one day. Yeah. I feel it. All right, I'll switch it up. I'll go first on Best Supporting Actress. I love everyone in this category, but I think I might have to pick Jodie Foster because I always love Jodie Foster. But in particular with Nyad. One of the big takeaways from that movie for me is walking away thinking to myself, like, I wish I had a person like Bonnie in my life. She just brings such warmth to that role. And like, it's something that I feel like I walked away kind of like reaching for and like wanting to be like that for others too. But while also respecting personal boundaries, which of course is a journey that Bonnie experiences in the movie. So I might pick Jodie Foster. I mean... I just started watching the new season of True Detective. I know that's not what we're talking about, <laughs> but like, she's just such a movie star. She's just such a movie star. And like to play opposite her, I'm sure that it elevates everyone's performance. Oh, I um, would believe that. I'm tempted. I haven't even seen that movie, but I'm tempted to go with Jody just from here. Just my love for her. I mean, I'm probably going America because mm -hmm. I... I, I can't kind of can't resist Barbie. It's I grew up with Barbies. I'm a deep feminist and it 
it to me crosses that line. It, it that let's talk about her. That monologue, I think, is it's really hard to not feel affected, whether you're a man or a woman or non-binary, whatever your experience in the world has been. I think it's hard to that's a, it's a very cohesive argument in that and a frustrating, painful moment in the film. And it's the heart of the film in a lot of ways. So I might keep America. Without a doubt. I still like my brain still can't process that in one single year in 2023, we got an exceptional Barbie movie and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. <laughs> like, back, to back too. The like 90s kids are like, you know, it, the joy that brought to my life. I can't even put it into words. All right. You're up first on our next one. Let's go best actor. Who do you want to see win that one? Without a doubt, I have to say I'm, a di- again, a diehard 28 Days Later fan. And I I mean, I, but I have to say, it's isn't it beautiful to see an actor grow before your very eyes and to have them be creating incredible work for so many years that you can track them? And it's almost like I feel like every year I get to see Killian Murphy grow and grow and grow. But specifically watching Oppenheimer and just the odyssey that that is just it. I mean, over I mean, his performance, even in that three hours, you're just like it blew my mind. I, I can't believe that he I mean, he's so amazing. I just love him. I'm right there with you on that one. I feel like any role, this is one of the biggest accomplishments to to, to achieve is when an actor can make someone's internal world external and you know, yes. make the audience feel and understand. But in particular, with a genius physicist who is on this one of a kind, like, how does he make me feel like I could understand what he's going through? That is just oh, such an really. acting feat to me. I can't. Truly. It's really a haunting performance. And I and sometimes you can't figure out if you like him. You're like, do I like you? But you always kind of do. And I think that he that's just his artistry that you always feel closer to him than you should. Yeah. And like that every ounce of that performance is imbued with like so, so much truth and authenticity. I feel like that probably helps create that feeling quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. I feel like we might align on this one for best actress. I have to go Emma Stone. I'm going Emma Stone. How, how does she do that? I keep describing poor things as like an accelerated coming of age journey. And when you look at where Bella Baxter starts the movie and where she ends up, that shouldn't be possible in like a two hour plus feature film. But yes. but she does it. She does it. I mean, she, another actor that you've seen create incredible roles over many years and you've seen her grow from the easy A days or the super bad, you know, she's seen her and she's got the chops She's got the comedy chops. She's got the traumatic chops. She's a brave actor. You see her try stuff that you know wasn't in the script. You know she's just going for it. I I have to say it's really hard to compete with Emma Stone. She is a star. She's so good. So good. All right. I am going to throw this one to you first. Best director. I'm going Nolan. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I feel it. It was one of those movies where I just was like, how does he do it? And the attention to detail. There's a scene that'll be like a 20 second scene and there's a zillion people and this, I mean, there's the spectacle and you're like, how did he also, you're like the budget on this thing. <laughs> you're like, wow, he's really living the dream over there. Yeah. I mean, the like the budget on that thing, but also like in comparison to some like epic franchises, it's still not nearly as much as like a $300 million movie. And then it's like the coolest thing ever that he made a three hour epic about a physicist that went on to be one of the mo- one of the highest earning releases of 2023. Like, dude, if you could do that, like, all the power to you always. Totally. I, I love his work. Oppenheimer, though, might be one of – I, I feel like I can say this with confidence now. It is my favorite movie of his period. I'm just blown away by every single aspect of that film and just, like, how, is he, how he surrounds himself by – by top tier artists in their craft and how seamlessly all their work comes together and how it's like an all boats rise situation where then it blows my mind even further. He's something else. And to create something so huge and um, historic in our culture and our world, but that felt so small in some ways that felt so intimate in some ways. All like I keep thinking of that close up 
of Killian's face and just this panic of what have I done? What have I created? And that is what I remember most in the film, despite all the huge spectacle and, and the the explosions and all of that, I just think of Killian's face. And so that's pretty impressive that I still just think of this character's journey. So he's just, uh, he's it. He's the top of the mountain. I, oh, without I, a doubt. I love Nolan. I feel like this is pretty obvious at this point. So I'll just blurt this one out. If I could pick who won best picture, I think it's the film that will win best picture. I'm going Oppenheimer all the way. I, I can't believe how many categories I'm looking at. And like, part of me is like, I don't really care who wins. Cause I could genuinely be happy for so many of these films and people, so. but I'm also very much behind the Oppenheimer sweep. I think it's going to happen. I think it deserves it. My best picture pick is Oppenheimer. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't disagree with you, but I, there's something, and I go back and forth and back and forth, but I have to say, if, if I was an Academy voter, it'd be Barbie. And oh. you know why? Because I think there's something really epic when it succeeds commercially zeitgeisty and manages to be a woman's story, a feminist story. It has something to say. It reached eyeballs, made billions of dollars. It was against all odds in some ways because it's this Mattel doll. Everyone can turn their nose up. It tried to get made with a bunch of different people. And of course we have Margot Robbie. Of course we have Greta. Of course we have Ryan Gosling. We have the movie stars. We have, but there's, in some ways it feels like something that could have easily, everyone turned their nose up to, could have easily not worked. And so I think in my, and I had my Barbie dreamboat as a little girl and I felt like that wasn't cool. My friend was literally ostracized when she was a little girl for playing with Barbies. <laughs> Barbie is loaded. <laughs> the fact that it could be like make it all the way to the Oscars, it's kind of special. It really is special. And I'm I'm hoping that whether it's in that category or something else, it's going to get the celebration it deserves yes. on Sunday night. I can't believe it's Sunday night. Wow. But th that means the Oscars aren't until Sunday. That means you have a whole bunch of days to go buy a rent scrambled and enjoy <laughs> that. So that's your homework assignment, Leah. Thank you so much for joining us and for talking about your filmmaking experience and then having a little Oscar fun with me as well. And thank you so much for helping me in all these different iterations of my career and being down to talk about my work and review my work and, and help spread the word a bit. So I just, it's really cool to grow with you as well. You're I am here at your job. There's no, there's no stopping. I'm here eagerly awaiting the next one as well. And I will be here to, to cover the crap out of it. I promise you that. <laughs> to everybody out there, thank you for watching this edition of Collider Dailies. John and Maggie will see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Pacific for a brand new episode. Mm -hmm.